So yeah, welcome everybody. Today we're gonna to hear more about a couple of the History Center of Tompkins County's photo collections in New York Heritage, as well as the History Forge program. And with us, we have Donna Eschenbrenner. She's the Director of Archives and Research Services at the History Center and Eve Snyder, the History Forge Project Coordinator, as well as Claire Lovell, the Digital Services Librarian at SCRLC. And so welcome and thanks for being here. Thanks so much. It's very nice of you to have us. I'm Donna Eschenbrenner and I'm the archivist here at the History Center in Tompkins County. I'd like to say thank you to Claire and to Jessica for inviting us to chat with you today. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about the History Center's photograph collection. Uh, speaking as archivist, in my opinion, the History Center's photographs are the crown jewels of all the History Center's archival materials. We have many types of photographs. Um, we have many types of photograph collections. The collection is actually a collection of collections. Um, it's broken up by type. So we have a collection of postcards, a collection of stereo views, a collection of photo albums, cabinet cards. It's also categ categorized by topic area. So we have a collection of professional photographers collections, again, a collection of collections. Um, these are photographs put together by people who actually made their living here in Tompkins County selling photographs. In fact, some of our very earliest photographs are from professional photographers. That beautiful uh, stereo view, that double image that you see at the bottom of your screen, that was photographed by Joseph Burrett of Ithaca here in the, the 1860s, about 1863. Two of our largest collections are our family business and organization collection and our general photo collection. Our general photo collection or our GPF is our largest collection. We have about 15,000 photographs in that collection. Um, it's our workhorse. It's divided up by topic areas. So there are about 300 different topics. We have a handy little pamphlet that we can hand out to people telling them what the various topics are. Um, anything and everything you can imagine. Waterfalls and school groups and steamboats and automobile accidents. Uh, Ax railroads, um, railroad depots. Um, the beauty of this collection, uh, it's suitable for casual browsers as well as serious scholarly research, but my predecessors deserve credit for this. Several years ago, they took the entire collection and photocopied the whole thing. So we now have photocopies and copy prints of this large collection for browsing purposes safely in the research library. Um, so now the originals, the fragile, very delicate, very old originals can stay safely in the archives without getting used. Of this 15,000, I would say about a maybe a third, a quarter to a third of them are of the built environment. We have photographs of so many buildings. It gives you an idea of what people thought was important to photograph over the course of the last 120 years that this collection was compiled. Um, I'm gonna to talk today about residence photographs and business photographs because that's what Eve is most concerned with, with History Forge. Um, but we have so many buildings. We have banks and uh, churches and barns and bridges and uh, railroad depots, college buildings, school buildings, um, all suitable for serious research and, and casual browsing. Our residence photographs, <clears throat> excuse me, our residence photographs range from everything from very iconic, significant landmarks to the house next door. The two photographs that you see there represent those two extremes. The one on the left that you see, the McGraw Fisk Mansion has an enormous amount of history behind it. The building no longer exists. It was owned by Jenny McGraw Fisk, um, a very generous benefactor in the community who died tragically young. Um, after she died, Cornell took it over and installed a fraternity there. And just a few years later, it tragically burned down with the loss of seven lives, both firefighters and local students. Um, so it's got a terrible history behind it. So, but we're very happy to have the image to document this history. A new building was put on site that the fraternity lives in right now. Um, and the house that you see on the right, again, just the house next door, we have uh, uh, residence photographs of houses like this and all kinds of other residences, um, apartment buildings, fraternity houses, row houses, uh, two family houses, uh, student housing, houses that are no longer homes. If you see the building on the left on, 
In the middle there, it looks like a beautiful mansion. It started out as a mansion for the Sage family. Uh, it was taken over by Cornell. It was a, an infirmary for them, excuse me. And um, right now it's the home of Cornell University Press. These images are used by all of us here at the History Center and by patrons, but there are two groups that are the most heavily used, the, the most common users of this collection. Um, I would say the first is people that are interested in the history of their homes. People are, really wanna know what their houses looked like. So we get a lot of local people that really wanna find out if there are images of their house from 50, 80, 100 years ago. The second group of users that's very common for this collection is students. Ithaca College has a very strong architecture program. Cornell University has, of course, the College of Art and Architecture. They use these images a lot. There's historic preservation and planning students use this as well. It's also used, this I love, it's also used by kids, school kids. One of our former education directors came to me several years ago and asked me to make photocopies and copy prints of houses. She wanted to use it for a fourth grade class. And she said, it's perfect. Every kid lives in a home of one kind or another, so they can relate to this. It's very relatable for kids. And she wanted to show them it's a good way to relate to local history by seeing homes that people lived in before they were born. In addition to local homes, she also asked me to make copies of commercial buildings, local businesses. The average fourth grader walks into Wegmans with their mom. Um, looking at a photograph of a grocery store from 100 years ago is a very different thing. And that's also a very relatable thing for kids. These are the kinds of images that Eve is using in History Forge. I like uh, the, com the, the commercial buildings because they, I think, show so much more than just local architecture. They show the people of the time. They show the technology of the time, the transportation of the time. I love the way these images have people posed outside of the buildings. It reminds me of the dozens and dozens of school images that we have of kids standing out, you know, cl posed class photographs, kids standing outside their school building, you know, standing very stiffly and formally. Well, local businesses did the same kind of thing. They're good sociological studies as well, though, because you can see local immigrants and what kind of businesses what kind of businesses they got involved in. At the bottom left of your screen, you see the, the Greek American Fruit Company. On the right side of the screen, you see um, Ithaca Steam Laundry and you see the people standing out there. You see what kind of businesses were willing to hire women or people of color and which ones were not. If you took, take a look at the top right-hand side of the screen, the Ithaca Daily News, everybody's a white male. Take a look at the technology of the photographs, the music store image that you see in the middle, they sold phonographs. Um, I have users that come into our research library that don't know what a phonograph is. Most of us, well, I will say many of us probably do, uh, but that's, I think, very useful for historical research. The technology of transportation, horse and wagon, and on the left side of the screen, we have a commercial grocer with very early delivery trucks. I think that's a very important thing that these photographs are very useful for. In addition to our uh, GPF, one of our largest collections is our family, business, and organization collection, our FBO collection. The FBO collection, um, again, it's a collection of collections. It's broken up by these three major topics. And um, I always have a lot of fun with uh, programs like this or when I give tours in the archives, I get to pick photographs that are meaningful for one reason or another to highlight for people. So the three that I picked today, um, I think are very significant and I like to share them. The one that you see on the left is from the Newman family collection. It's Jenny Newman holding her baby, Mary. Um, I wrote an article about that photograph and the collection that it's a part of. We have Newman family materials here at the History Center. And um, I used that photograph as an accompaniment to the article. And it's, it just tells this lovely story about two or three days after that article was published, I got a phone call here at the History Center from this elderly lady uh, complimenting me and thanking me for the article. She said uh, that was a very meaningful article for her. And she pointed out the baby in the photograph, baby Mary. She said that baby Mary was her mother. So I got to meet this nice lady and she showed me other pictures of the family. And it was a wonderful symbol of the, the long thread of history from a 120 year old photograph to a person talking to me today. It was very meaningful. Um, 
The photograph that you see in the middle is of, of the Andrews Confectionery uh, business here in Ithaca. They closed sometime in the uh, late 1960s, or early 1970s. There are still people around that remember shopping at Andrews Confectionery. Uh, the photograph that you see um, on the right-hand side of your screen is two ladies from Club Essence, a local African-American women's group. Uh, they did tremendous amounts of work here in Ithaca. In the late 20th century, they started their work in the 1970s and they were active um, until uh, the early 2000s. I think of all of our FBO collections though, our Southside Community Center photograph collection is probably one of the most significant. It's about 90 photographs overall. It's a celebration of Ithaca's iconic organization that serves the local African-American community. It was originally founded in the 1920s uh, by a local group of very dedicated African-American women. They called it the Service League and they did not have a space. They were working out of homes or from uh, the St. James Church basement or uh, gyms from local schools. And they desperately wanted to have a building for the work that they were doing. Um, so they were able to leverage their support in the community into funding from the federal government in the 1930s during the Great Depression. Uh, the Southside Community Center was founded and built as a WPA project. The WPA, the Works Progress Administration, was a New Deal initiative during the 1930s. From about 1935 to about 1943, it employed about 9 million Americans. And this is extraordinary at a time of enormous unemployment. It was such an important lifeline for so many people. And the WPA actually transformed the face of America. It built they built bridges and hospitals and schools and dams. Um, but they were involved in more than just construction projects. They were also involved in arts projects, theater programs, uh, library programs. Um, and one of the projects that they were involved in was here in Ithaca and they built the Southside Community Center. But they did more than that. In addition to the construction project, they also documented that construction project and documented the early years of the South Side with a photograph collection. So a, a WPA photographer took a whole series of photographs celebrating the opening of the South Side. Uh, this is a these two photographs that you see here are from their opening festivities from 1938. And if you take a good close look, um, on the right side of the left photograph and on the left side of the right photograph, of course, is First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, she came here to New York for those opening festivities, but they did more than just document the festivities. They documented the programs there at the South Side um, over the next couple of years. If you take a look at um, uh, the left-hand photograph, the the gentleman standing in the middle in the back behind the kids. He was Mr. James Gibbs. He was the first director of the Southside Community Center when it opened in the 1930s. And he was interviewed about the Southside. And he talked quite a bit about the programs and the crafts programs and the sports programs and the scouting and um, the music programs. Uh, the Southside Community Center had a program to teach kids how to be journalists. They, um, had a mimeographing class so that kids could write their own newspaper and publish it every week. And uh, it was an, an extraordinary series of programs that they hosted. But one of the things that he talked about as being one of the most important things that he did, he set up what he considered a kind of employment agency. And um, he worked very hard. This, don't forget, this is in the 1930s. Discrimination was rife. It was very, it was also the Great Depression. It was very hard to get jobs. So he worked very hard with local employers to try and place local African-Americans. He worked with Ithaca College. He worked with Cornell University. He worked with the Ithaca Gun Company, the Cayuga Tool Company, to try and place African-Americans as much as possible in jobs. And he referred to them as his graduates. One of his graduates became the first African-American secretary at Cornell. She was um, later what they called the head secretary in one of the larger departments in the College of Arts and Sciences. So he was particularly proud of that. Um, and we're particularly proud of this collection. This captures this moment in time when this fabulous organization, which still is here in, in Ithaca, um, this captures this moment in time when it first started. Does anybody have any questions? I'm gonna look at the chat here. Yeah. 
haven't seen any pop up yet. Great. Okay. I'm going to pass this over to Eve Snyder, my colleague from History Forge, and she's going to tell you how these images are being used. <coughs> Excuse me. Hello. Um, uh, Don, if you want to stop sharing, there you go. Um, I, I just want to say I apologize. I'm having some internet problems. I um, had to move rooms, so hopefully it'll be taken care of now. Uh, but um, if if it's not, please, and there's something that um, gets missed, please let me know. Okay. So, hi everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Eve Snyder, as as has been mentioned. I'm a historian at the History Center in Tompkins County, and the project coordinator for our History Forge project. So what is History Forge? History Forge is a dynamic web environment that allows people to explore their local history through the individuals who lived here, lived there, and the buildings and neighborhoods they lived in. It brings to life the rich demographic data available in historic resources, such as the US Census, city directories, and maps like Sanborn fire insurance atlases, integrating them with, an, with archival photographs by visually, visually displaying the information on historic or current maps. History Forge is an open source platform developed by the History Center in Tompkins County that can be adopted by, any, by communities across the United States. Our model project is in our hometown of Ithaca, New York, and we currently have three additional History Forge sites in Auburn and Elmira, New York, and one in Oberlin, Ohio. History Forge is also a volunteer-driven project with volunteers adding the census records and other components that provide the project's infrastructure and learning more about local history in the, pro uh, in the process. Since 20 college and university, and even some people outside of Tompkins County since COVID have helped transcribe census records for History Forge Ithaca. Before I get to the photographs, I want to tell you a little bit more about how History Forge works. Sorry. So uh, volunteers access the handwritten census records, handwritten manuscripts of the census from familysearch.org and transcribe the information into History Forge, into the History Forge database. In the process, uh, transcribers enter each address. They then attach each person's census record to the building record with that address, connecting the people to the buildings on History Forge. The address for each building is geolocated when the building record is created allowing the building and people records to be mapped on store map layers like this one from the 19th Sanborn map for Ithaca. Click a red dot on the map to see the building, building record. Building records can contain several components. I'd like to note that the building records in History Forge contain as much information as volunteers and institutional staff have the capacity to enter. As a result, some buildings have more information than others, but we're always looking for people to help add more content. So the building records can contain the following information. Building name, in this case, the R. Valentine House, uh, the address, and that can include uh, uh, historic addresses as well as current addresses and, and multiple addresses, uh, year built and year demolished, if that's known, the building type, construction, uh, architect, description, and the residents from different census years. The preview here has limited information about each person. Each name is clickable and will link you to that person's information from the census record that year, as well as that of other members of their household. In the future, you will also be able to link to other information about each person, including census records. Other census records, sorry. Uh, the building records also contain map layers. You can choose from one of the historic map layers to learn more about the building in the neighborhood at the time, or no historic map to enable Google Street View to see what the building looks like today. These are the building records for the R. Valentine House. On the 1889 F.W. Beers map, you can see that the property is aptly marked Mrs. Valentine. The other image is the Google Street View of the current location. Lastly, each building record can contain photographs. This photograph is of the R. Valentine House. The photo viewer allows you to enlarge details from the photograph. So this photograph of the Valentine House is one of the photographs we digitized through the grant from the South Central Regional Library Council. They are all av available in the building records on History Forge and on, as well as on New York Heritage through the History Center and Tompkins, County, Tompkins County's page. From the photo page on New York Heritage, you will find the URL, the building record on History Forge. So you can link to it from there as well. 
these photographs not only let you see Ithaca's built environment as it was, but in combining them with the features on History Forge, you can learn more about the people who live there, the neighborhood as it was, and see what the building or its location in this case looks like now. The Valentine House and others on the block were demolished in 2013 to make room for a student housing complex, College Town Terrace Apartments, the image on the right here. You can also view the changes to Ithaca's built environment by using the maps, which called the Forge, to visually display the building records on historic maps, which are layered over a Google map. Here is a comparison of the 1910 Sanborn map and the satellite view from Google Maps of the same block. On the 1910 map on East Seneca Street, um, to, the, to the left of the intersection there, you see rows of houses. When you compare that to the satellite view, you see several newer, larger buildings. You can also use other features from Google Maps, such as Pegman, which you can drag out into a spot on the, current, on the map to see a current image of the street. I'm going to focus on this intersection at the heart of Ithaca and part of the block to show how much this area has changed over the years. Currently, the building on the left is home to an M&T bank and the Ithaca Extension Center of Tompkins Portland Community College. And while a bank has been on that site since 1878, the Ithaca Savings Bank was initially located in the former home of Ezra Cornell. Ezra Cornell's home is on the left. And on the right, we have a photograph of the Cornell Public Library, which sat across the street from it. The library was demolished in 1960. It's now a bank parking lot. Across the street from the library was Old City Hall, torn down in 1965. There is currently a parking garage at that location. So continuing across the, to the last corner in that intersection is a site that was home to a few buildings. In 1901, it was the home of Ithaca Publishing Company and the Ithaca Daily News. In 1912, that building was torn down and replaced by a single story brick building that housed the Ithaca Realty, Realty Company until about 1935. More recently, a hotel has occupied this spot along with a Starbucks. Uh, we know from the map, um, sorry, we know from the maps and other sources that there was a hotel, also a hotel there, the Tioga House, the YMCA was there at one point, and a wholesale fruit and vegetable company. So returning to um, East Seneca Street, uh, down the block from where Ezra Cornell's residence stood is 121 East Seneca Street. A photograph of the house which stood here until 1929 is on the bottom left. Um, it was torn down and replaced by the Seneca building, the current image of which is on the top. Um, to, to its right stood 119 East Seneca Street, a residence which also housed Sheldon's Photography and Allen's Music Store sometime around 1935. This building was knocked down in 1949 for drive-through banking services for another local banking institution, Tompkins County Trust Company. A little further down the block sits the only two houses left standing, 111 and 109 East Seneca Street. The brick building in the photograph on the right, 113 East Seneca Street, was torn down in 1960 to make more room for parking for the Tompkins County Trust Company, the building of which is currently standing um, on the left in the, in the left photograph. Um, thanks to SCRLC, however, anyone can see what it looked like on History Forge. In addition to showcasing photographs of buildings that no longer exist, History Forge can also make sense of a current landscape that can be comprised of a mixture of disjointed buildings from different eras like this one. This is a section of Prospect Street now. As you can see, it is an eclectic mixture of buildings from different eras. The building on the right is currently an apartment building. The brick building contains offices and the building in the back looks almost abandoned, but not quite. Together they form a bizarre hodgepodge of buildings on what was once a desirable hillside covered with mansions overlooking the rest of the city. The above, the quote is from one of our volunteers. She had walked down the street hundreds of times but wasn't aware of its history. After I used the photographs and maps on History Forge to explain it, its history to her, she told me that History Forge helped make sense of her neighborhood in a way that was previously inaccessible. Well, this might not be your neighborhood, I think History Forge can make sense of the buildings on this block for you as well. So this is the same area of Prospect Street on an 1899 map from History Forge. There were large estates with gardens. These were large estates with gardens. The yellow building in the middle 
is a three-story house built of wood. Hint for those of you who aren't um, familiar with these maps, yellow is wood or frame construction. Uh, this house was built for William and Andrus and was known as Bowery Hill or Prospect Hill in the 1880s. Uh, the red building to the left is a two and a half story brick residence, and reds for brick in this case, uh, known as Terrace Hill, home of Mrs. Jane McGraw. Fronting Prospect Street on her property is a greenhouse and a brick build, outbuilding, likely a carriage house. So this is that section of Prospect Street on the 1910 Sanborn map from History Forge. The photograph is of Terrace Hill, circa 1915. We don't have a photo of the brick carriage house from that time, but we can guess by the location of the building on the map that the brick structure that exists, still exists today was its carriage house uh, built in the 1880s. So Terrace Hill was demolished in 1935 to build the corporate headquarters of the GLF, the, Grain, the Grange Lead League Federation, the middle building in the current issue, current image. A beautiful building, it is currently owned by a local developer who has an apartment inside. The building on the right is also owned by the same developer and is currently an apartment building. Originally known as Babcock Hall, it was built by the GLF in 1955. I'd be remiss if I didn't throw this painting of the Andrus estate in here to show off what this area would have looked like at one time. Obviously not something we digitized from this grant, but it's, it's a beautiful example of what that hillside looked like. Um, after 1935, the GLF expanded into the rest of the block, initially using the Andrus House, this house as one of its administrative buildings. In 1955, they knocked it down and built Babcock Hall and parking. So all these pieces of the puzzle were there when this volunteer walked past these buildings jumbled together from different eras. But History Ford provided the historical context necessary to fill in the rest, to make the history of the block accessible to her so she could make sense of the neighborhood as it currently appears. I'd also be remiss if I didn't point out that while I focus on the photographs and buildings on History Forge, that is only one part of what the project does. As I said earlier, the census records provide a major part of the framework for this project. Ithaca History Forge has compiled five complete data sets of the city of the census for the city of Ithaca that anyone can explore. These can be accessed from History Forge itself as well as from New York Heritage. Why would anyone want to do that, you might ask? Well, the reason is this. Most people who engage with the census at all do so from an individual level, like looking up an ancestor. After all, that's all you can do from the genealogy websites. History Forge allows people to engage with all of the information on the census. So for example, if your grandfather was from Italy and worked on the railroads, you might wanna know about the other Italians in the community, what kind of jobs were available to them, where they lived, et cetera. As I mentioned this before, we've been doing this here in Ithaca since 2016, but last year, three partner sites started building and using History Forge in their communities as well. So if you're interested, we currently have the following sites and are looking to add more. All of our sites are also looking for volunteers and as a digital project, History Forge is a great remote opportunity in a time of COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Are there any questions for Eve? Okay, we'll have time for more questions at the end, but I think Claire wanted to say a few more words about History Forge and some of the other projects that exist beyond just the Ithaca instance of History Forge. Yes, this, um, oh, is my, okay. this will be very brief. Um, I just wanted to show some examples of how this works in Auburn. Um, so share my screen. We see History Forge Auburn. Hopefully, yes. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So uh, I'm Claire Lovell. I'm the digital services librarian here at South Central Regional Library Council. I happen to live in Auburn, um, up in Cayuga County. Uh, when I first took this job in July of 2020, uh, my predecessor, Julia, I think is here. Hi, Julia. Um, had just worked with Eve here and Bob Kibbe on a grant for History of Forge. Uh, I saw the site and absolutely fell in love. Uh, since then, I'm very happy to report that Seymour Public Library District is one of those partner sites, and they've begun their own uh, History Forge installation, as has Elmira and Oberlin. I volunteer as a transcriber for Auburn's History Forge 
And it's um, it's an enjoyable way to spend your evening as long as you can read cursive and you don't mind typing. Um, History Forge is absolutely perfect for small cities and towns like Auburn that went through um, you know, massive upheaval in the 20th century. Uh, in Auburn's example, they tore down over 100 buildings for urban renewal. Um, and another reason Auburn is a perfect kind of place to do this is that they had a lot of uh, very uh, particularly defined ethnic neighborhoods. Like all of the Ukrainians lived on these blocks and all the Italians lived on these blocks and all the Poles lived on these blocks. Like a lot of our upstate New York towns, you can, you can really see that in History Forge when you pull up a census and you say, show me where people born in Italy live and you can see the three streets. <laughs> um, so I wanted, to, so Auburn, Auburn is on the larger side. It was, I think it's larger than Ithaca for 1910. Uh, in a year we've done, uh, I think 13,000 records of people and almost 3,000 buildings. Um, so I'm gonna show you how this works. Okay, so here's the forge of Auburn. Um, you can see all of these different maps that we've done and all their terrific overlays. Uh, the one we've been working with the most is the 1904 uh, Sanborn fire insurance map. Uh, you might be able to tell right away that the 13,000 people we've done are mostly in this uh, southwest quadrant and the northeast quadrant, and we haven't gotten to the other sides yet. Uh, okay, so what you might not know if you're not from Auburn is that we had a very significant industry over here, very important company called the Columbian Rope Company. Uh, and I want you to imagine this, not just as someone who lives in Auburn, but if you were an educator of some kind, this is the kind of history that's often lost. Like a fourth grader today probably doesn't know what the Columbian Rope Company is, even though if they had lived 120 years ago, everyone in their neighborhood would have depended on that for employment. Uh, so imagine teaching your, your students this. Here we see the giant factory. If we go to data, we can filter all of these 13,000 records under the industry, which was written back then. And we can say things like anyone who is said to work for Columbia Rope Company, so maybe Columbia and Rope. Here's that filtered view and we can map it in the forge. And here you see all the people who were listed of the 13,000 records we've done so far, who worked at that Columbian Rope Company right there. So of course it won't surprise you that a lot of them live really close to the factory. And if we click on whoever lives at 7 Sherwood Street, probably one of those, maybe they're one of the laborers. And you can click on the person and find out more information. Um, as it relates to Auburn, I think it's really interesting to then bring another facet into this. So back on um, the, the, the table of data that we've done, we could add yet another filter, um, such as race, which was a standardized list from the census. So now we have two facets. They've got to work for either Columbia or Rope, and uh, their race is either Black or Mulatto. And you can see that there is only one person <laughs> in a city of tens of thousands of people, only one African-American man who is a, a janitor here. And where did he live? He lived on Fitch Ave. So here's another cool thing you can see. Here's the fire insurance map. We, we did have people living on Fitch Ave and Chapman Ave. In fact, if I get rid of the Columbia Rope Company filter, you can see that all of the people who were listed as either mulatto or black, live down in this quadrant. And you can also see that regardless of which year you choose a map, they rarely bothered to cover Chapman Ave or Fitch Ave. So if you're doing a lesson on systemic injustice, this is a really quick way to show it and how it's relevant to your local town in upstate New York. Um, I had a, I watched a little article uh, it's like a CBS local news piece about um, redlining in upstate. And he had, the guy had mentioned that Elmira and Auburn had redlining maps. Haven't really found that, but I did find this, uh, just a city ward map 
where somebody had gone through and indicated which streets who lived where. And so here you go. These are the these are the humans who are listed as being in the so-called colored section. And this I mean, to what even Donna said, this is a great way to bring history alive to kids today, to people who live here today. And um, it's just really effective. And it's it's been a blast to work on. Uh, so I hope that you will consider taking up History Forge in your own place. Um, and if you'd like to do so, and you are an SCRLC member, of course, we have digitization grants that will open up in, um, I think, about a month and a half and can fund this kind of project. And that's it for me. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Claire. And did you learn anything about your own residence? You live in downtown Auburn, right? Yes, in a, in a closely knit community uh, where the houses are very close together in a development that was being built around 1905 to 1910. So it doesn't exist on the sandboard map that we relied on a lot, but um, and none of the people had very interesting jobs. They were all like middle managers and principals. And I mean, it's fine. <laughs> it's cool to find out though. <laughs> so, um, okay. And Mary Carol's asking about the construction being built on Cayuga land. And she's thinking about Dr. Jordan's history center presentation on burial grounds. I don't know if, Donna or Eve can speak to that at all. You're muted, Donna. Sorry, thank you. No, I tend to leave that to in Kurt's capable hands. Mm -hmm. And I was also curious if in recent times there's been so much development in the Ithaca area, if the History Center ever intervenes on behalf of a building or is asked to research the historical background of buildings? And... To, no and yes. No, we never intervene. We are not an advocacy organization per se. Thankfully, Ithaca has one in H Historic Ithaca. They are very definitely the kind of organization that would intervene in, in that case. Uh, they would step up to try as hard as possible to preserve the historic built environment here. In terms of research though, yes, we are here with a, an enormous number of resources for people to research the local built environment, including some of the photographs that I talked about. So yes, we for that question, I answer a very em emphatic yes, we help people with that. That's great. Yeah, and Claire pointed out that there's a preservation association of central New York that I was not aware of. I think they're more um, geared towards Syracuse, but they've expanded before. Um, but they're the kinds of people who a couple decades ago would have, you know, linked arms in front of a building. So any other questions for our presenters today? All right, I'm not seeing any. So thank you everybody for joining us and thanks for a wonderful presentation and for sharing these projects with us. Thanks for having us. Thank you.